Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about anything and everything Beatles, the past, the present, sometimes even the future. You never know from week to week what uh, topic we're going to cover. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the four regular co-hosts of the show. You might know me from my other Beatles program, a syndicated show called Every Little Thing. The Beatles, every little thing, that is. Being joined by my other three co-hosts. First of all, we have a contributing writer for Billboard magazine, also Access.com. That being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. Also, we have the senior writer and editor for Beatle Fan magazine. Since the very beginning of the magazine back in uh, the late 70s, that's Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And also we have a freelance writer and musicologist and also writer for Beatle Fan, that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. On today's show, we're being joined by two very special guests. And uh, quite a while back, we actually interviewed one of these special guests here when the show was just Steve and me. Uh, We have Lefty and Zeke Weakling. Of the Weaklings here to join us for uh, to talk about their brand new album coming out in November called Studio Two. Hello, guys. Hi. We're happy uh, to be speaking with you. Hello, gentlemen. (laughs) Well, yeah. I'm uh, on behalf of Zeke, who just walked out of the room uh, to go to the bathroom for a second. uh, I'm. I'm I'll represent him. That's a, that's a first. We've TMI, never had TMI. Say, <laughs> yeah. We've never had to say that. For, in, Guys, in, your introduction was taking a little while, and he thought that, you know, it was time to, you know, drain the main bank. But he's back. I'm feeling much better now. <laughs> okay. Good to know. <laughs> All right. So for anyone who's not familiar with the band and also the first album, which we covered earlier in one of our shows with it when it was just steve and me uh the whole concept behind this band was to record original material that harkens back to early beatles sounds and sounds of the 60s and also mix that with rare material uh that the beatles uh either recorded and didn't release themselves or gave to other artists and you're continuing along the same lines on the new album so uh what gave you guys the idea to do this concept and uh, the album called Studio Two is obviously na- named after the studio at Abbey Road where the Beatles did so many of their recordings. Talk about how that album got started. Well, actually, Studio Two was named after the studio in which we recorded the album. That's, what it was. That's why we named it that. That's the name of the album. Um, we got together. Uh, there's a thing that uh, we were doing for years that the uh, Beatles bash and it it was like a large show with a lot of different performers but the we slowly it morphed into this the rhythm section ended up being the four of us uh so it's a quartet uh consisting of Zeke myself lefty and smokestack weakling and rocky weakling and so as a quartet we started to realize that we really enjoyed playing music as a quartet. We, uh, one year we, we focused on the first two Beatle albums and, 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 and the arranging of just those four guys was fabulous. And we realized that as we picked the songs apart and really studied them, and it's like, hey, th- this all makes sense. This is a, this is a really uh, well choreographed uh, arrangement. You know, every song was. So we said, well, let's be a quartet. And, um, you know, we're not the wig wearing kind of guys, but but we said, well, let's take some other gigs. Let's take some gigs as a quartet and not the big show, the small rock show. So we started to do that. And uh, then we said, well, let's, you know, let's make a CD like let's make a, a little CD that we could sell at our gigs. Merch, merch CD. Yeah. And so and then we and then we said, well, let's record some of these songs. That we, you know, some Beatles songs. Well, I picked up an, this album, a vinyl a vinyl record at a local store that was entitled The Songs That Lennon and McCartney Gave Away. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. said, you know, we could we could take these songs and sort of retool them, imagining how they would have been done if the Beatles had actually done them because they were done by various artists. So we 
that that was our original idea. And then then Lefty said, well, we're going to do that. Let's do some originals, too, because we had original songs that were in the same vein. Uh, so that's what we did. Yeah, there there are. I do remember bumping into. In fact, I think I had a couple of CDs from other, uh, you know, Beatle bands, tribute bands of, you know, these groups trying to cop note for note. Uh, what the Beatles did and invariably when you hear you know Nowhere Man or She Loves You or whatever done by anybody else as you're listening to it you say well this is not as good as you know this is not the record that I loved mm -hmm. as a kid yep. so the idea was well maybe and it was Zeke really as I recall maybe it was that record but the idea of let's do Beatles songs that they didn't do and and so that's what we did we we uh we looked and we continue to look for rare Lennon McCartney and Harrison songs. And uh, so we did it. The, the first album, which everybody calls monophonic on gem records and tapes, uh, was um, half of the album were uh, early Beatles songs that were that did not uh, that were not recorded by the Beatles. And this new album has four I think, uh, songs. Lennon McCartney. And, we, and we tried to dig harder on the second album. We went for things that were even more rare. The, the other, first album had songs that you can find that were done by the other artists, but this, this second album, nobody had. Yeah, it's pretty rare. It's songs that I didn't actually know. Maybe you guys would know being the Beatles. Ken knew. Ken knew. Ken did. Yeah. yeah. But, but well, you know, we're kind of new to us, or at least some of them were. Well, two of the songs actually originate from the Quarrymen uh, yeah, rehearsal exactly. from 1960. But when you started to actually perform your own original material, was that at the Fest for Beatle fans? Or how did that actually start and what was the reaction? Where did we actually start performing our original songs? Well, we had this album, right? We, we made this. Uh, uh, Marty Scott of Gem Records approached yeah. us and said, I want to put out a record of you guys. Right. Because at first we were just going to make a little record that we well, well, did. Well, we did a live rehearsal. We, we, we did that often. We, we were going to do a show. Before we do the show, we'll do a rehearsal at a small venue and we'll rehearse in front of people because it's a better way of kind of cementing the material into your head. And so we did the same thing prior to going into the studio to record the first record. We had a live rehearsal. So we actually were performing our original material and the people material at, at the rehearsal. Yeah, we were just getting ready for our first album. Right. And um, Marty Scott signed us to his label. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was always a part of it. It, it. You know, Zeke and I have written songs for a number of artists, and we've been successful together and separately on a lot of big, you know, records out there, uh, charting records on big record labels. And, and so we've always, I mean, for 30 years now, we've, yeah, we've, we've been uh, collaborators. So when we got together to play Beatles songs, it was for fun. The band has always been for fun, but writing a song that is inspired by the whole Beatles style was our self assignment. And, yeah, it was a fun, actually, it was a fun, yeah. really fun thing to do. And it still is. It's yeah. a, it's a, it's a great thing. Instead of us trying to sound modern, we're digging, you know, well, we're digging back to the music that woke us up as children, you know? Yeah. <laughs> okay, before I pass you along to another member of the panel here, I was just reminded of how uh, Paul McCartney once said that to write a Chuck Berry song is not as easy as it sounds. You might think it's just three chords, but it's far more difficult than you realize. When you're trying to do something that sounds Beatlesque. Do you find it easy or is it challenging? You know, it's getting easier. Zeke is, has become, it's very easier for him, but it, it is hard. And, and I remember having this conversation early on when we first started writing. Yeah. Writing, you know, for songwriters, ballads come very yeah, easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ballads, every songwriter will tell you that ballads are easy to write, but we're trying to write almost all up-tempo rockers. Yeah. Uh, which is what the Beatles did in the early days. Uh, they were a rock band. They were definitely a rock band. Yeah. They were definitely a dance band. As for the difficulty, you know, one of the things that makes it less difficult is the fact that it's so much fun. You know, when you come up, come up with a song and, and, and you're, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out, we, we've been studying the Beatles for years. And, and so putting all that knowledge that we've gained to use is, is fun. And then uh, they actually come up with something that sounds like it. Or what would they do here? What do they do here? It's just uh, a lot of fun. And so it makes it easier. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Al, how about you? 
I w- just wanted to get a, a, a feel for – now, I, I'm assuming even though – you both have been in the business for 30 years or more. Can I assume that you, neither one of you had ever recorded in Studio Two at Abbey Road? That's correct. Okay. Give me an idea of how that felt that first day, walking into that studio. Now, I know you had done some, uh, some prep work, consulting with, uh, with Ken Scott, among others, and having original equipment moved in, but give us an idea of how that felt that first day walking into Studio 2. Well, you know when when Dorothy walked into the Emerald City for the first mm-hmm. time? <laughs> there, that's what it was like. Yeah, it's beautiful. It was beautiful. It's real bucket list stuff. Just the whole concept was like everybody got lit up when we realized, you know, we can do this. We can do this, you know, and, and um, also, you know, walking into that space, it is very familiar to people like you guys and uh, us. You see it. You've seen it a million times. You know it. You know, visually, you know it really well. But but this was like our – Yeah, it's different when you get there too. Yeah. Though, when you're actually there. I mean, I've seen pictures. But but it, it, it reminded me of the – well, the first time I saw – the lean, only time I saw the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Again, an iconic thing that I'd seen my whole life. But when I actually saw it in person right in front of me, it took my breath away. And being in Studio One took my breath away, same way. Kind of reminded me of when I met McCartney. But We both yeah. met McCartney separately. Zeke played with him. But I, I was having this conversation with this guy. Right. And I'm looking at his face. And I'm like, here's a guy I'm that thinking- I, I've watched him. I, I know that face inside out. It's like a, he's like a member of my family, but he's never even laid eyes on me. No. Right. But, but it's this incredible familiarity. It, it, it was kind of like that, like walking into and we were home and and for us to lock that place out for a number of days and do what we came to do and record our own music along with the uh, Beatle music was a, a, just a dream come true. And we know, were we were home. We were definitely home. home. And, and when we had to leave, we were so sad. <laughs> we were oh, like, I bet. I don't want to see. I want to see. And you got to use some actual equipment, not only the audio equipment, but also some of the pianos that they that they actually used on Beatles recordings. We did. We did. When Lefty sat down at the Steinway upright and he played the final chord of the Day in the Life, and you mm-hmm. heard it reverberating in that room, those overtones, that sound, that piano, you said, Oh my God. It's a eureka thing. That's it. Yeah, every, all heads turn and jaws drop. And yeah, it's like, wow. oh my god, that's it. You can <laughs> hear when you're standing there. And you don't have to have to have tell you that's the piano they used. Right. Nobody has to say a word. You just hear it. But yes, we did. You know what? Uh, what a great studio. They were very uh, accommodating. We contacted them before. It was uh, Alan Parsons that suggested we work with Toby Hulbert, who was our. Uh, engineer. He's an Abbey Road staff engineer, but he's a young guy that's really into everything, retro and vintage and stuff like that. Interestingly enough, Abbey Road does not do that many retro projects. They predominantly do like, you know, right. soundtracks. And stuff. Yeah, they don't do mm-hmm. projects. Of, uh, us doing, going in and recording the way we recorded, which was like the early Beatles, it was very novel to them. They were excited because they never get to do it. And we had contacted them in, in advance and we asked for, listen, guys, we want all the old stuff, whatever you got, the, whatever left <laughs> old gear you got. And so they wheeled in uh, these very old desks, these very old uh, consoles. And uh, one of them was used on the Abbey Road album. Right. And the other one was a red console, of which there's only a handful in the world. And um, that was a custom console made for EMI. So yeah. only EMI Studios had them. So mm-hmm. we we were using old gear and set up the way the Beatles set up, and you know we were we were in search of some kind of magic mojo or something. Mm-hmm. Well, was there kind of a magic mojo in the air? <laughs> uh, yeah. Is it on the record? <laughs> it it sounds like it. It does sound like it. <laughs> yeah, it was great for us, you know. Um, just it, it was a wonderful experience and there was magic mojo in the air yeah. it was every time you walk out of the control room look down in the room and you can feel it you look at that view which is beautiful and and it yeah absolutely yeah, it's a real bucket list thing but we also had a job to do you know we, yeah. i i didn't we weren't tourists we paid 
good money to record in Abbey Road, specifically that studio. And, um, you know, so we, you know, we, you'd flip back and forth between, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, here we are. And wait a minute, we got, we got to do another take. We can do that song better. You know, so we did, for the most part, we worked very hard to make this record while having the time of our lives. Absolutely. And uh, before I pass you over to Alan, I just wanted to make a comment about about that, because despite the fact that, you know, obviously the Beatles are the, you know, the overriding influence, this wasn't like it doesn't sound like just, you know, a band, you no, know, a Beatle band in Studio 2. It, it's not, it doesn't sound like, say, you know, one of the Rain bands or 1964, the tribute going into Studio 2 and trying to be the Beatles. There are other influences here. I mean, I, I was hearing uh, Rock Pile and the Raspberries and a lot of Scotty Moore from, uh, from Rocky's uh, guitar work. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so obviously there was there was more than just uh, more than just the Beatles influence in the air. Well, and, and also, if you really want to play like the Beatles, you can't play like the Beatles. You have to play more like the Beatles influences. Yeah. Exactly. So, so Scotty Moore was a big influence in George Harrison. So, if you really want to get in their head, you have to go back to their influences. Mm-hmm. Chuck Berry and, and and Elvis and all those, you know. Uh, Buddy Holly, all those guys, yeah, Little Richard, the whole bunch. So, so we were, you know, when we were working the material out, we were thinking of that too. We weren't yeah. just thinking about the Beatles. Yeah, and we're not really trying to sing like the Beatles. We don't sing with British mm-hmm. accents or any of that. We, you, you know, we're being adults about this. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, very we much so. We are limiting ourselves to basically the instrumentation, though. We, it, it, most of the record is, is two guitars, bass, and drums, and then there's some keyboards, and, uh, piano thrown in, and a few tracks. Uh, mm-hmm. So, we, you know, we, we're, like Lefty said, when we had done a lot of Beatle albums for shows, later out, the later albums, the White Album. We did the whole White Album. We did uh, uh, Sgt. Pepper's, so all, all those things, Revolver, which requires orchestration and a lot of overdubs on the records and a lot of multiple guitar parts. When we went back for this one particular show, it was called Birth of the Beatles, and did the first two records, we realized how great they were and how great those recordings were. They were done, and they were done with four guys because we worked the parts out, and then we said, well, we don't need to add anything else. We've got everything done. And so that's when we realized we could do that, and that's what we tried to do in the studio as well. Absolutely. Alan? Okay. Um, you know, you mentioned having the old equipment and going for that feel. I was wondering what you did in terms of recording techniques, because, you know, as, the, as, as you know, the Beatles early on would do, you know, live in the studio, live vocals, all of that stuff. And, and it was only sort of later they began overdubbing and Ringo was sitting in the corner learning how to play chess. What did you, how did you do it? Well, to be honest, our first album, we were much truer to recording absolutely live. You know, there, there were songs where, um, you know, we're, we're singing together on one mic next to the drummer, you know, and then for, for mixing purposes, that, that's pretty, you know. Pretty challenging. Challenging, yeah. Mm. So we, we did record everything live, all the rhythm tracks live, and, and we did a, a live vocal along with what we recorded. Um, and then, so. and then for this album, and then after we had that down, then we did go back and overdub the vocals again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we did. We did some cleaning up, you know. Um, so it, it, here's the way we like to think of it: our first album, Monophonic, was kind of like the first, you, you know, with the Beatles and uh, uh, Please, Please Please Me. Please. Whereas this second album is a little bit later. It's a little bit. Something in between Beatles for Sale, Hard Day's Night, and <laughs> let's say Rubber Soul. A little bit of Rubber Soul. We're, we're, we kind of got our foot into Rubber Soul, you know. So we did get a, you know, I'm playing piano on a couple or one or two songs, and, and you know, we're stretching out just a little bit. But it's still a rock and roll album, I think. Mm-hmm. So if you were using, I guess, the Abbey Road console, were you using, were you think, well, I mean, you probably record it to Pro Tools, right? I mean, so it doesn't it doesn't matter how many tracks you can always have more tracks. But the console was what an eight track console, I think. Yes. Yeah. Both there, consoles at the same time. 
we used the the Abbey Road console and the Red console at the same time. That's mm -hmm. true. That was more. So there yeah. were more, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. In terms of the uh, material, and, and particularly the you know the Beatles songs at the end of of the album, um, you know. Basically, all of those, except for Love of the Loved, which was a, a Finnish song that people did, including the, the Beatles on, on the Decca audition, um, some of these were really pretty unfinished songs, as we heard them on either the Quarryman tape or, I guess, because, because I know, uh, is from the Get Back, Let It Be sessions. Um, mm -hmm. But they were just sort of like walking through them and not doing finished takes. And the songs were kind of, you know, we don't know what the whole song was. So you had to do some extrapolation, I think, right? What, what was the process of finishing these off? Well, first of all, I want to mention that when, when Zeke met Paul McCartney at a party at bon, John Bon, bon Jovi's, Jovi's backyard mm -hmm. and Paul got up to, to play with them, Zeke asked Paul, well, now what is this about? Like you, you and John have like a hundred songs that you didn't record. Right. Yeah. And, and, and he and, said, he says, well, we exaggerated that. <laughs> I said, I said, you don't have that. Didn't have that many. He goes, no. I says, how many? He goes, well, I don't know. I says, did you have 10? He says, yeah, we had at least 10. I said, do you remember them? And he started singing them to me <laughs> in, in my face. <laughs> it was really bizarre. He was he put his face in my face and he was singing these songs. And I'm like, I, yikes. But, did, you, uh, did you put your iPhone on record? Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, this was like nine years ago, and they didn't have an iPhone. Oh. <laughs> well, did he say something about the quality? He said they're not, they weren't that Yeah, he great. said the songs weren't good. I, he, he said, I said, why don't you record those songs? You kind of owe it to posterity. And he says, well, they're not very good. Yeah, which so, is interesting. And so here we are 10 years right, later, and, right. we're, and we're, we're digging out these songs. Right. And there are things missing, and there are ingredients that could be added to really flush out – uh, flesh out, I should so, say, yeah. you know, and, and make more of it. And it reminds me of like when someone wants to um, make an old painting and update it and, and, you know, redo it, you, you know, and there's, there's pieces of the painting missing, but you have to kind of fill it in. You have to decide what color that the artist originally uh, meant in this painting. And, uh, you know, when you renovate a theater, you, you have to do all these things. If there's fixtures missing, you have to, find a fixture that seems to work for that in the right structure. period. Yeah. yeah. So that we, we kind of did a lot of that. We were, you know, we were filling in a few holes that they left. For yeah. sure. And, and it, one of the things that distinguishes us, us from other Beatle type bands is that we're, we were songwriters first. And uh, so it's not a question of us just going in and copying a record like, like a lot of bands try to do. And we've done that too. But, but we look at these songs and they'll, you step back and say, well, what if I wrote that song? What would I do with it? Because when you first write a song, that's basically all it is, is a melody and chords, and you, you, don't, you don't have all the arrangements. So, and the Weaklings are really good at, uh, I think, at coming up with arrangements. Uh, we, we sit around and hammer them out. So we just took the songs and started playing with them until, we, you know, until they started to sound like what we wanted them to sound like. Mm -hmm. Did you, um, when you finished it, did you run it by uh, McCartney, I guess would be the only one who... who uh, is decisive here, seeing as they're his compositions. Did you run it past them or send them a copy for soliciting they, comment they or anything? To, you will we, not answer our calls. We were kind of uh, hoping you that. Yeah, we were hoping. I see. You that <laughs> we did actually. There's the one now and then song right. that we looked at for a second because I'm sure you guys know that one, and it was one sure. of the ones that the, mm -hmm. the three uh, living Beatles. Uh, uh, began work on uh, for the anthology album, and um, you know we we started working on it, but but that one we it's had to reach not, out. It's we had not to published. Yeah, we had a, we reached out to, uh, to Yoko's Yoko. lawyer because technically I think it's John's song. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And, and it's not that song is not published, so you can't buy you can't get the rights. You'd have to get permission directly from Yoko. Right. And the, the lawyer declined to give us permission, so we yeah. we dropped uh, that. Hmm. Okay. Um, so over to Steve. Yeah. I was, I'm looking at the list here of the, of the songs. I mean, the three of the songs or two of the songs, well, one of the songs, love of the love, everybody knows from the Decca auditions and, and you must write. And, um, some days I believe are both quarrymen. Where did, because I know come from. 
It's the on the fly in the wall record. I let it be fly in the wall. Oh, record. okay, okay. Also, I think what the Black your... Album. <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. okay, <laughs> okay. How did you how did you get the uh, the uh, permission to record there? I mean, that seems like a not that I, I you know not that every band is going to be able to do that, but I mean, was it was it a big pro was it a major process to do that to record those songs? Well, I mean, no, to get permission to record there. Oh, that, be right. Yeah. Well, we pulled a couple strings, uh, but <laughs> you know, but at, at the end of the day, they they do like to accept the money that you give them to. Use. Oh, I see. Okay. You know. Okay. What was your schedule like there when you were working? How long did it take you to get to? How many days were you there? And what was the schedule like when you were there? We were in London for a week. It was an interesting several days. The first. First day we got there, Bruce Springsteen was playing at, at Wembley Stadium. And we, I don't know, found out about that through a fan. So no, um, Yeah, right. Yeah, my, my Rich told us about that. And, and, then, and so I reached out to Max because we know Max pretty well. And um, Max Weinberg. And, um, and he said, get us yeah. In. Yeah, so he, he, he brought us in and we, you know, we got to see the show. So our first day there, we went to see Bruce Springsteen, which was pretty cool at Wembley. And then the second day, we hooked up with uh, Ken Scott. Yeah. And he was doing a, a reading, uh, a playing of David Bowie's uh, Ziggy Stardust album because it was the anniversary mm. of the date where Bowie decided to quit being Ziggy Stardust. And it was at the hotel where he made that decision, where it all happened. So that's where we met Ken Scott. And he's, he's been a big part of the day doing that. The next day, we had a rehearsal. We rented a rehearsal hall because we wanted to go over everything again. And then we had two days two full days in, in Abbey Road. And uh, we recorded 16 songs in two days. So we were, we spent the whole, both days, it was, we locked out, you know, with yeah, our they were for 10 hour days. And uh, yeah. And, um, and we plowed through though, you know, it, it like we, well, we did all the rhythm tracks for all 16 songs on the first day. Yeah. First day. <laughs> One day. We were well, well rehearsed because and, we, we wanted to, you know, if you're spending, top dollar because it's a world-class studio totally and it continues to be so if you're going to spend that kind of money we wanted to be prepared so we were well well rehearsed and, and, and we plowed right through and not only did we do 16 songs we did at least three or four takes of each song oh. so we really recorded 48 songs um, <laughs> uh in in one day and the the engineer toby who was just a principal guy he i told him in the morning he said we're going to do 16 songs today and he looked at me like i had two heads uh, and then at the end of the day, I said, you didn't think we could do it, did you? Because nah, I didn't know how good you guys were. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a, so there's enough for, for another uh, for outtake albums? Uh, um, there's four there's extras, enough. right? Yeah, right. Because there's yeah. 12 on the album. Right. Well, here you go. Oh, it'll, it'll be on the next record. <laughs> <laughs> did you find, I mean, there's been... Uh, I've heard this before, and and you uh, you could probably confirm it better than anybody else could. That there is an actual sound specific to the studio. Is that pretty well? Is that correct? Every room has its own sound, so it is correct. Sure, it, it sounds like that room. And I, I, like I said, when he, when he played the when Lefty played the uh, the piano chord, I don't think it would have sounded as much like a day in the life had it not been in that room. Because mm -hmm. it, was, it was the right piano in the right room. Mm -hmm. But I mean, as far as going into another studio and say, say if you had done this in another studio, would it have sounded different than it did there? Is that, well, is that really good well listen to our first record. Yeah, because yeah. we, which, which, we did, which I did. Mm -hmm. but our, our first record was done with the same process. I mean, we we went in the studio and recorded it live. Okay. So, you know. Is it sound the same? No. Have you yeah. it sounds different. You know what? I, I, yeah, I have to say I did learn from this process. And, uh, you know, in retrospect, does Dark Side of the Moon sound anything like a Beatle record? You know, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, there are... It's got I, a vibe. I think it has a vibe. Well, there's a vibe, mm -hmm. but does it sound like the Beatles? Like, you know, does playing a Hofner bass make you sound like Paul McCartney? I mean, there, there's a number of things that you can you could point to. I mean, I know that personally I've picked up like, you know, I like, I, 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 I picked up Jeff Beck's guitar one time and I, and just the tone that he gets out of it is completely different than the tone that I get out of it. No, for sure. You know, so I, I, you know, it is definitely how you use it and, and mm -hmm. who's playing it, but definitely each studio has its own set of acoustics and sounds and, um, you know, and we, and the chain, 
the, ch the chain yeah. is important. The, 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 the equipment good. chain is important. We're going into the vintage mics, going through the vintage boards. That adds to the sound. That changes the sound radically. And, okay. and you're definitely going to hear that. I will add that this is our, our second album is mono again. And uh, mono is uh, it's a challenge. It's very different than the way we were brought up, you right. know, making records and, and recordings. It's a whole different thing. It's difficult uh, to to fit everything in that same space. Whereas it's a lot easier to kind of here we put this over here, put that over there. But to get it all to sound right coming out of a single source is. Uh, it's a vintage kind of sound. It's a retro kind of sound. It's it's the kind. It's the way records used to be made. You have to use a different means of separating the instruments. You can't separate them spatially with stereo, yes. like you do with stereo. You have to mm -hmm. separate them by their frequency content. Mm -hmm. So you filter different instruments. Say this is in this frequency range. This is in this frequency range, and you mix you mix it that way, which is new a uh, new for me. Great. Yeah, great. You know, also that studio has. Like something like eight hundred vintage microphones. These really hmm. old. I was I was gonna I was gonna ask you how much vintage equipment is still in there. A lot of microphones. They have a guy whose whole job every day is is to take care of those vintage mics. Yeah. <laughs> He's got new old stock tubes that go yeah. in those things. Uh, where he got it, who knows? <laughs> and that's what he does is maintain those microphones. Uh, wow. For me, the, particularly, uh, I was excited to be using the Fairchild limiters, which were the compressors that the Beatles used on all their records, and, and we used two of them, right? Mm -hmm. And and those things were famous for blowing up and being difficult, but that is the the sound on the Beatle mixes and and stuff like that. When the compression was, you know, these old Fairchild uh, limiters, which. You know they're not made anymore, and, and these guys were the, these were these ancient pieces of equipment. Plus, we had other compressors as well. But for me, it was just the thrill of having the signal chain go through some of that World War II technology. You know, yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Mike's from the '40s for yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you guys. Ken, back to you. This is fascinating stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I want to go back to uh, the songs you must write in some days. Earlier, you revealed to me that these songs were copywritten. And because of the fact that the Beatles never released it, and I don't know of anybody else that ever recorded them until you guys did, I would have thought that they weren't copywritten at all. What was the process like in trying to find out if the songs were copywritten? And did you uncover other songs along the way that were Lennon McCartney songs that maybe you didn't even know about? The answer to the second question is no. But the answer to the first question, it was surprisingly easy. When you want to do a cover of a song, you need to license it. So the fact, uh, copywriting, by the way, occurs whenever you create, put something down in medium. It's it's automatically protected by copyright, even if you don't register the copyright with the copyright office. So everything is copyrighted. But whether it's registered, that's a different matter. These items were definitely registered, and they're definitely published. Uh, and you can you can license them uh, by from Harry Fox Agency. So you, all we did is go in Harry Fox Agency and, and do a search, and the songs popped up. It was actually easier than you might think. Hmm. Hmm. Were there other songs? I know you mentioned Now and Then. Were there other songs that you were considering? Because you were really going for the rare here. This yeah. Album, rarer than the first album. I, to be yeah. honest, um, in looking for Beatles songs that they didn't record, there really aren't that many. And what what they did is as they progressed in their seven year recording history, they started to use everything they wrote or came close to it. For instance, the song Not Guilty might have popped up, you know, later for the anthology. Well, but Not Guilty, is, Harrison recorded that on one of his solo records. Too. Oh, yeah, he did. Right. Mm -hmm. right. But, you know, for the most part, most of the things they wrote, they cut later on in their career, in the, in the second half of their career. But early on, when they were young guys, uh, there were a few of these leftover songs that they didn't, you know, they just didn't flesh out, they, they didn't include. So there's a, there's a few of those. But nevertheless, we, they're getting harder and harder for us to find material that we really love of theirs <laughs> you know, that, that nobody knows, put it that well, way. Well, yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to do for the third record, what we did on this one, to find these songs that no, that nobody knows or nobody's ever cut before. So, which is why we're really happy we did it at Abbey Road because we think we did it right. If you're going to do it, 
that's the place to do it. But yeah, there's not there's not a treasure trove of unknown songs. When we became aware of uh, You Must Write and Some Days uh, by reading Mark Lewis's book, that's how I became aware of it. And then I trolled around to, to, to find that the songs actually did exist. The demo did actually exist. There was another song mentioned in that book. And I can't think of it right now. But it, was, it was only a title. We don't have the music. We don't, all we know is the title of the song. So can't it, find it. We, yeah. we may write a song with that title. Just. <laughs> Well, maybe these guys would, would be able to find Maybe. It. Could be Winston's walk or pinwheel twist. Mm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah take, really. I mean, if we, if we take the title of a song out, it's not going to sound like the other song, and it can't be, it can't be plagiarism. But um, What's yeah. the song? I forget. The, I've got to look it up. I can't forget the yeah. title. Uh, I forget the title. You know, I'd like to it mention. It was kind of cool, though. Uh, we, we, we do something throughout the record, both records, really, um, if it's a Lennon McCartney or Harrison song or one of our own, we drop these little Easter eggs, we call them. Yes. And, and that is, you know, little ideas, little arrangement things mm-hmm. that harken mm. back to familiar Beatle quotes. But you have some of them you have to be listening really close to find them. And, uh, you know, the other day I was – and it, it happens in almost every song at least once. There's, oh, yeah. Every song's got Easter eggs. Yeah. So – it's it's kind of a fun little thing. It's fun for us, and I would like to think it's fun for the listener to like. Oh, wait a minute! Doesn't that sound like you know? Yeah. Uh, really fun for us. It's like it, there's a bit of a puzzle to all this for us, and that helps make it a. It's it's a fun game we're doing, you know. In fact, love of the love is a is a big Easter egg. <laughs> I don't yeah. know how much you want to, you know, reveal. <laughs> Let people well, what do you well, which hear part, the album. Which, which part of it do you think is an Easter egg? You can reveal. Uh, it. I would say the whole thing. Well, the song itself, you know, is, uh, was, you know, Scylla Black's uh, is the version that I know. Although there right. are, there's, but uh, yeah, we kind of did like we looked at it a bit like because mm-hmm. we said, well, let's do the let's do this song like because you know. Uh, like the Beatles because as opposed to the Dave Clark Five because. But, you know, just the, the thing, let's let's lay heavily on three-part vocals and uh, very little instrumentation and let it sit there. You know, you might say that's a uh, that's an Easter egg, but there's there's some other quotations. Yeah, that's, not, that's not really an Easter egg because you don't – nobody's – Somebody might hear it and say, oh, well, it's a similar approach to Because, but oh. it doesn't sound like Because. But, but, no, I but know the big Easter egg is before the song, right? Yes. That's, yes. What, that's what you're really talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a big one. That's a, how, how we get into that song uh-huh. is it, a big Easter egg. You knowingly, <laughs> he, you chuckle knowingly. Yes. <laughs> well, the cool, the cool thing is, I'm sure you guys know that the end of the Abbey Road album was originally in the middle of the medley. Right, right. Mm-hmm. The, Mr. Mm-hmm. Her Majesty and that the, the chord you're talking about was in, in the middle after me, and Mr. Mr. Mustard. So me, and Mr. Mustard ends with that chord, and you can uh-huh. actually take it. You can actually take it and, and splice it back together the way it was originally to hear what it would have sounded like. So that's how we created the sound. Was we played me, and Mr. Mustard, <laughs> including <laughs> including the final chord. We did, and because there was there was a lot of there was some doubt on our parts. As to whether we could actually reproduce that sound, yeah, and make it make, and have it really be credible to sound like like the end of Abbey Road, and so we played me, Mr. Mustard, up through the whole ending of it, and then we took and, and we edited off the whole of the song except for the last chord, and lo and behold, you heard it. <laughs> we we had this opportunity. We're standing in Abbey Road Studio Two, and we had an opportunity to try some of these infamous moments on Beatle Records. You know, we played the uh, Hard Day's Night. Like the open to the hard day tonight, you know, and it's and not on, it's not on this record. It's so not on this don't record. look for it. But but if you look carefully, you will hear the final chord of day in the life on this record. And you know, <laughs> you know, we were in there. It's just like, oh, let's try this. You know, how'd they get that? You know, we've studied the music so well. We know the nuance. We know the the, the you know the, the voicing of the each guitar part and all of that what octave the bass note is in. Let's try these things, you know? And so that's kind of how we got to the, um, you know, the Easter egg for uh, Love of the Love. Hmm. So what you're saying in a way is that one of the four missing songs that's not on this album is Mean Mr. Mustard. No, we're not saying that at all. So then there are really five (laughs) missing songs. 
Well, we didn't count that. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess you could say that. We're not going to do anything. Okay. Of course, part of me, Mr. Mustard. You know, there's a slight <laughs> difference between just hitting a chord or it being – I think it's a big difference. A splice. I think it's more than a slight difference. Yeah. It wouldn't have sounded like it if you hadn't spliced, if you hadn't mm-hmm. cut it. Yes, it's a difference. So so we said, well, let's play the last chorus of He's a Dirty Old yeah. Man. Right, right. That's all we played was the last chorus. Dirty old man. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Hmm. There you hmm. go. <laughs> you mentioned Ken Scott and Alan Parsons before. Aside from recommending the producer, for this album, did they give any kind of um, uh, guidance in recording there uh, at not, uh, Abbey Road? Uh, not, not a whole lot. Ken Scott was uh, he was very adamant about the the compressors, which compressors to use, and uh, he was cool. You know, we, we talked to him at length about it. And uh, Alan Parsons, I actually kind of do gigs. Uh, I'm on double gigs with him sometimes. In another band, and and uh, so he 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 strongly suggested Toby, which was a really good idea. And you know, in talking to both these guys, we get the vibe, and we and we and we we drop our ideas and see how they reacted and stuff like that. To be honest, did they want to be the the guys to recreate a Beatles sound? No, no, nah. no. They're, they're they've moved on to other things, of course, and. Mm. You know, and and they've probably been approached by other people before, and and I don't blame them. You know, they've got they've got their own records to do. Yeah, yeah. Zeke, did you say before that you you worked with Paul McCartney? I know you mentioned uh, I didn't work with Paul. Say, I was um, asked to provide a band for a party at, at John Bon Jovi's house, uh, and and there were all, a bunch of celebrities there. Billy, Billy Joel, Julie Joel uh, Roger Waters, uh, Jimmy Buffett, and Bon Jovi. Bruce Springsteen was there, um, and Paul McCartney was there. And and Paul McCartney and some of the other guys sat in with us and played for about an hour. And and then afterward, I got to meet him and talk to him, hang out. Uh, so it was uh, that was my my working relationship, but it was fantastic. And I'm you know one of the best nights of my life was hanging out with Paul. I can imagine, Al. Lest anybody think that this album is all Lennon-McCartney songs, actually, uh, unlike the first album, which was, I guess, about evenly split between the Lennon-McCartney songs and originals, uh, actually, probably two-thirds of this album is actually originals. Right. And, again, stylistically all over the place. Well, with the first record, we were kind of playing this game. We mixed we mixed the songs up in, in the order of the record so that right. we were playing a game of uh, ha- if the casual listener could tell which songs were written by the Beatles, which ones were written by us. And most people couldn't, couldn't tell unless you were already familiar with the songs. We took a different approach on, on this record. We, did, we said, OK, we're done with that. We put the four Beatle tracks as at the end of the record as bonus tracks. And then the main part of the first part of the album is, is all ours. So um, hmm. we wanted to distinguish the two and say, okay, we, we're not, we want you to know which ones we did. <laughs> Although, would you say that, uh, that You're the One, which is the, the one song that Rocky wrote with you, right. is, uh, is kind of the Ringo song on this album? <laughs> not at all. Oh, okay. And not not at all. It's it's he, his inspiration for that song was uh, "You Like Me Too Much" by George Harrison. But ah, it, okay. In, mm. in that middle period, you know, George was very country influenced, and Ringo was country influenced. So that's yes. what, that's what you're hearing there. But it's really more George than Ringo. Yeah. Well, I have to agree though with Al that uh, to me, when they went through their Buck Owens phase, yes, <laughs> I mm. think of Ringo for some reason, even though you know. Clearly, he didn't sing all the, you know, I don't want to spoil the party and all these other things. No, he sang Act Natural. But uh, Act Naturally yeah. was the and one that sticks. On. what goes on. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, but Rocky is our illustrious guitar player, not our drummer. Yes, right. Exactly. And uh, of the originals, uh, are there any particular ones that, you know, for you are favorites? Well, the ones... The ones that were really uh, kind of put that the record label has chosen to push would be Don't Know, Don't Care and Little Elvis. Uh, oh, yeah. But personally, 
I mean, we, and we I'm might kinda, differ on this. Love can. No, is I'm kind of gravitating toward love can too. Yeah, love can. I love and uh, and I like love of the love too. Hmm. I like them all. I, th- I I I'm proud of the record. You have, you guys, have you guys thought about the next one? What you might do uh, for the next one? Yeah, we thought a lot about it. <laughs> 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 well, we, we, we re- as we pointed out, we we recorded part of it already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and we're not really young guys, so we figured let's let's like you know let's make a plan, let's get this stuff done <laughs> before one of us has you know like a stroke or something. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you what are you guys going to be doing to promote it? I mean, uh, are you gonna are you gonna do any special gigs or any special appearances or? Yeah, we're having a record release concert at the House of Independence in Asbury Park on November 11th. 11. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll be at Daryl's house on January, January something. something. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and I should be giving away tickets for that. Oh, that'd be great. That's nice. <laughs> that'd be great. Yeah, we might be. We're, we're, we're talking about recording possibly a live album. Uh, at Daryl. Yeah, at Daryl's. Oh, wow. Ah. And that's uh, uh, January 21. And, and that would be in between the next album and this album. <laughs> and so... The album that with the songs that you haven't heard yet, the live album would not have any of that stuff on it. It would be something else. Yeah, we might we might do this uh, a live album as our next record, quickly followed by a fourth studio album. And that's just how ambitious we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I, see, I, uh, I, the the sorry. four the four new songs or not the four new songs, but the four unused songs. Were they all originals or are there any again little Lennon McCartney nuggets? They're all original. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. They're all original, and they sound later, like later, later Beatles sound. Ah. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Hmm. Any uh, t- any, uh, Oh, I was just gonna. Let me just ask: Are, are any? Uh, are you guys are predominantly on the East Coast. Any chance you get out this way and, and on the West Coast? Nothing's impossible. Uh, we'll have to. Be, it'll have to make sense financially. To do that. Yeah. Sure. How about how about Pittsburgh? Zeke okay. is from Erie, PA. Yeah. Which is near oh, okay. I know Erie very well. I, yeah, I grew up 100 miles north of Pittsburgh. So. Okay. Then you know you know the turf. I do. Yeah. And there's a, there's a couple of really nice theaters in Pittsburgh. I'm, I'm really, actually really good friends with uh, Donnie Iris and and their band. Oh They're yeah. Popular in Pittsburgh. So. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, I've been to a lot of shows at Daryl's house. Why are you picking that particular venue to do a live show? It's a wonderful place, and I love the sound there. It's, but it's, uh, I know you played there already. Yeah, it's an in- intimate place. It's small, but and it looks like it's a log cabin, basically. But it is wired for sound, and there is a little control room off to the side that the, the audience doesn't get to see that is packed with state-of-the-art rec- right. digital recording gear, and it's... It's really, really impressive. And, uh, and when we played there in the past, we've gotten some really good right. recordings. We've, we've got multi-track recordings from from playing there in the past. So it just it's all set up to do it already. It, it won't cost us very much. So uh, it, only, it only makes sense. Very good. Cool. You're also doing a charity show for uh, and Lu- Wednesday? Lyrics for Lucas. So we, lyrics for Lucas. We, so what's that about? Think. It's a charity for a little boy, I believe, uh, with um, you know health problems, and and uh, we're helping out, you know. Yeah, Wednesday the the twenty sixth at the Starland Ballroom, right? And uh, yeah, occasionally we you know we just did a charity last Saturday night, right? For special special people united to ride Spur, which is uh their equ- an equestrian group where they have the special kids. Uh, just teach them how to ride horses and have a lot of fun. So, and we also well, that was two Saturdays ago. That last, this past Saturday night, we played in Hoboken uh, at uh, Maxwell's. Yeah, club called Maxwell's, kind of a famous venue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought mm-hmm. Maxwell's closed. So did we, but the, no, it, it, it reopened. Reopened it, instantly. It didn't we take. Did. Yeah, I, I covered its closing night. <laughs> what is it still right. doing there? You know, I think, well, I hadn't been there in a few years, but, but I think it had been renovated, cleaned up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it was in good shape. Yeah. And we had a, we had a really fun time mm. and it was a beautiful night. You know, there's beautiful weather here on the East coast right now. And 
I, I took a drive out to look at the Hudson oh, yeah. and, uh, and I, and I was trying to, while I was driving, I was, I was trying to, uh, Google, you know, where Frank Sinatra grew oh, up. Yeah. I'm looking yeah. for, yeah. because that's Hoboken, man, yeah. but I couldn't, I couldn't. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that, I don't know if that's a Sinatra venue. I was curious if it was a Sinatra venue. Who knows? Or is it too- Probably not. I Maxwell's, I doubt it. No, I don't okay. think so. Okay. Not the kind well, of room, actually. But yeah, anyway, anyone's- this Sorry. thing we did recording at Studio Two, which we named our album Studio Two about, Studio Two at Abbey Road. Um, this is, you know, this is one of my bucket list things that there are still a number of working studios that are historic, legendary studios that still exist, as well as there's some venues out there. I mean, I played uh, Buddy Holly's uh, final concert was in Clear Lake, Iowa. I played at that place. Mm-hmm. But, in, you know, someday the, the Weaklings possibly were going to record at uh, Chess in Chicago. Uh, ooh. I'm in Memphis. Mm-hmm. You know, um, these places still ex- some of them still exist. And uh, so that's, you know, but for this record at this time, uh, it was such a thrill recording at, you know, Studio Two at Abbey Road. And so that's why we decided to name the album that. Mm-hmm. Apple Studios is another one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If anyone's interested in this uh, charity show, Lyrics for Lucas, you said it's at the Starland Ballroom. Right. Star- That's in Sayreville, New Jersey. Correct. Right. On October the 26th. 26th. Thank you. Yeah. Where can people get your album besides that? I know I saw it listed on Amazon today. Where can people get it besides there? It, it's going to be released on November 18th. Right. It'll be in stores all over. All over. You can buy it in record stores. You know, Amazon or record stores. Yeah. Or, uh, I, I don't know what other, what other online outlets there are for it besides Amazon. How does one okay. call records anymore? I don't know. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> you doing a vinyl edition? There is a no, vinyl yeah. edition, yeah. and oddly enough, on this one, there is a cassette version. No. Because, oh, geez, really? There <laughs> is an argument that cassettes are having a some kind of comeback, so we I, are I just, on cassette. <laughs> I just bought a uh, one of those Crosley all-in-one uh-huh. things with the turntable and the CD player and all, and there is, on the side, a cassette player. Wow. You know, wow. what? You know, it's a recording medium. Cassettes are actually very hardy. I just moved. We're in a new place, and, and I've got boxes of cassettes, and a lot of them are like old songwriting yeah. ideas mm-hmm. of ours. Yeah. Which, and right now, I don't really have a cassette player, and I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to have to buy a cassette player to <laughs> listen to this. I've got an extra one, too. Yeah, I'll borrow yours, yeah. That's fun. <laughs> the song we were talking about is called Keep Looking That Way. Oh, yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah, do you mm-hmm. think you've ever heard it? Haven't heard I've it. I've heard of it. I've never heard yeah. the song. Yeah. I don't think anybody has. So we're like we've become forensic Beatle guys. Yeah. We're like, you know, yeah. We're- <laughs> and seriously, if you guys become aware of anything that we're not aware of, we'd appreciate hearing it. Yeah. Yeah, we still need to well, learn the, pinwheel the, twist and how that goes. And uh just fun. You've also got all of those uh you know, there were a lot of solo things that they wrote individually and gave to other people. Right. At, you know, <laughs> so so there's a, a whole bunch of things there you could um Right. Tap into, but we may do something different. Uh, also, we're, we're toying with the idea of taking some songs that that are not uh, unknown or, or, or that are well known, mm. and doing our, doing our own spin on them. Mm-hmm. That's another. So. Mm-hmm. The other thing too, as we are a quartet, we are really a power pop band. We're not a Beatles tribute, mm-hmm. you know. And and like I said, we're we're not wig wearing guys. Uh, we're serious musicians, and good players solid players but but it's really the genre of power pop that the beatles invented and that we are kind of about so you know we're also looking at that too it's like you mentioned the raspberries and, and uh rock pile and those yeah. are great power pop bands you know cheap mm-hmm. trip even, even jellyfish i mean there's there's a number of mm. tremendous power pop bands and, and great material out there so we can perhaps touch on that mm-hmm. early time Grin or something, yeah. but or just do you know, just do continue to do wh- what we do and uh, have fun doing it. And the I would the raspberries were a, a big influence for me coming up because they're from 
Cleveland and I was from Erie. So I used, right. to, I used to go see them play when they were playing clubs. Uh, and they, they did kind of what we're doing. They played originals, original songs and Beatles songs. Yeah. Uh, mm. Doing get back and they were doing it. It was great. You know, I was amazed. And, uh, so I was kind of, I was kind of wanted to do what they did. So <laughs> here we are. Nice. Did you see them when they reunited a couple of times? No, I no, I just saw them back in the day. Oh, okay. Wally Bryce is still around. Is Wally Bryce? Yeah, he's still around. Yeah, he's still around. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. Ooh, cool. Yeah. So you also have a website, correct? Yes. www.weeklings.com. W e e k l i n g s. And, and that's a good way Facebook, to get in touch with you. Facebook page. Yeah, you can get in touch with us on the website or Facebook. Either one. We're easily approachable. Yeah. I just want to say a shout out to our band members, uh, Rocky and Smokestack, as well as uh, Marty Scott, our manager, Sammy Boyd, and Franco Thank and you. Maureen, our, our publicity, publicity department, who probably hooked us up with you guys. Absolutely. Yes, they, yes, they did. Yep, they did. Well, Lefty and Zeke, this has been so much fun, and we wish you much success with the new album, Studio 2. Mm-hmm. And also, investigate the first album also. Much Great. Fun. Great. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, our email address is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We also have our own Facebook page, Things We Said Today. If you want to get in touch with Steve, why don't you tell the folks how they can do that? Beatles Examiner at gmail.com. Um, <laughs> I also have my own personal Facebook page, and I have a Beatles news group called Beatles News and Commentary, where we talk about this show, and we talk about all sorts of fun things. Okay. Alan, how about you? Um, you can get to me through Alan Cozen on Facebook or Alan Cozen Remixed. Maybe I should start an Alan Cozen mono page. Um, there you go. But, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll go with Remix for the moment. <laughs> so, yeah, that's it. Lefty and Zeke will be immediate fans of that Facebook page. <laughs> no question. Love that mono. Yep. <laughs> Al, how about you? Uh, on Facebook at Al Sussman, uh, on Twitter at ASUSS49, or uh, through www.beetlefan.com for Beetlefan Magazine. And as for me, Ken Michaels, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. Uh, you should also check out my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, for weekly Beatles trivia, great prizes I give away, and lots of interviews, including a new one with these same two guys, with right. Lefty and Zeke, which right. will be on my website probably by the time the show airs. So what did Get you guys tell dose. Ken that you didn't tell us? <laughs> Just kidding. You'll have to listen on my website. Okay. okay. A little right. bit. We repeated ourselves a little bit, but I thought there was some extra stuff. All right, Lefty and Zeke, thanks so much for joining us. Welcome. And for Steve, Al, Alan, Lefty and Zeke, this is Ken Michaels saying thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.